Good morning, church. If I'm being honest with you, I prefer to skip the introduction and the video and get into the word. For this reason, uh, the worship was fantastic this morning, and my sermon this morning is about worship. So it would be a natural segue to just jump right into the word. Uh, thank you to Josh and those who led us. Uh, you led us well into praising our Savior. Uh, but I do need to introduce myself, and then, yes, there is a presentation I'd like you all to look at that has to do with the field we're going to. Uh, much of who I am has already been said. Uh, let me just comment a couple points about my testimony and how the Lord's brought us to this point. Uh, I was raised in church, as many in this room probably were. Um, I was converted under the preaching of the pulpit in my church. Mom and dad brought us whether we wanted to or not, and we heard the word declared. And it wasn't just the gospel being preached. We also got to see, even from my earliest years, we got to see missionaries come up before our church and talk about what the Lord was doing on the mission field. And then afterwards, pastor would get up and say, now you young kids out there, consider giving your life to something like this. My uh, commendation to you parents, grandparents, as many kids are in this room already, bring them. Let them hear the word declared. Let them be challenged to go to the nations. But what about America? America needs more pastors and church planners. True, but America's had the gospel since its inception. There are places in the world, like we'll talk about here in a minute, that still don't have it. So consider these things. There's more to say about uh, specifically the field of Japan that we're going to, but I want you to see it first. So uh, if we could have the video queued up. This is just a five-minute presentation that's already begun. <laughs> Let's just watch it. I'll come <laughs> on, I'll come on <laughs> We do missions because there are still places in the world where there are no worshipers of God, no followers of Jesus Christ. We do missions so that men, women, and children might be saved. We go to teach them the scriptures so that they might know God, their Creator, and know what He requires of them. We do missions because the name of Jesus must be made known in all the world so that God gets the glory he deserves. Before we even met, my husband and I both knew we wanted to give our lives to missions. And the several missions trips I was able to take in my college years only confirmed this calling in my life. It was only after our missions trip to Japan in 2018 that we became aware of the great need in Japan. Like my wife, I was exposed to the great need for cross-cultural missions as a teenager by taking missions trips with my church family. Since graduating college and getting married, my wife and I have been in ministry training at our local church to help us understand how to love and serve God's people. Having been equipped and sent out of our home church in Louisville, Kentucky, under the direction of our pastors and members, our plan is to establish other local Baptist churches in Tokyo, Japan. We will seek to do this by sharing the gospel with the Japanese people and then seeing that those who believe are loved and discipled in a local church context. During our first term, while we are in language school, we will be partnering with veteran missionaries Steve and Bethany Carter to assist them in the ministry at their church. Under their mentorship, we will be learning how to evangelize and disciple Japanese people in their own culture and context. Hi, my name is Steve Carter. I'm a missionary to Japan and pastor of Akigawa Baptist Church here in Tokyo. We are so excited to have Joe and Sierra come join us as we share the gospel of Jesus together here in Japan. Our church family, Akigawa Baptist Church, is thrilled to have a part in preparing them 
to effectively preach the gospel and to pastor their future brothers and sisters in Christ. And it is our prayer and our hope that you will join us in partnering with them so that through your faithfulness in supporting and praying for them and their faithfulness in ministering the word of God to your future brothers and sisters in Christ, that one day it'll result in incredible fruit that is added and abounding to your account. Japan is one of the most fascinating countries in the world, while at the same time being among the most lost. It is an ancient country, well over a thousand years old, yet has seen almost no Christian influence in its long and dark history. The population of Japan today is 127 million. It is roughly the size of California, but has three times as many people. One fifth of them live in the ever increasing mega cities like Tokyo. The two dominant religions in Japan are Buddhism and Shinto, and most Japanese people adhere to one or both of these. Because these religions focus on doing good now so that you will have a better afterlife, the Japanese are outwardly very kind and moral people, while on the inside, they are still dead in their sins. They need new life from Christ. They need forgiveness of sins. They need to be restored to God their Creator. But who will tell them how? Japan is one of the most modern, unreached nations in the world, with less than 1% Christian, and only half of those evangelical Christian. It needs more missionaries. Please pray for us as we seek to bring the gospel to Japan, specifically the city of Tokyo. I wanted you to see that, especially the second half with all of those shots of downtown Tokyo. That was the same city, by the way, all three of those. Um, as your pastor said a moment ago, Tokyo is currently the most populated city in the world. The greater Tokyo area is the home to 37 million people. I did the math on Tulsa this morning. That's 89 Tulsas to put things into perspective. And the statistics say that 83% of all Japanese people alive right now have never knowingly met a Christian. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine with me, just for illustration's sake this morning, let's pretend that Shinto Buddhism was actually the true way to heaven. How many of us in this room even know a Japanese person? Raise your hand if you do. There's three, four, five. So there's five or so people in this room who even have a shot if they know that's where they need to go for their spiritual answers. That's how Japan has been for its entire history for the most, most part. We're walking into the second most unreached people group in the world. We were talking with your pastor briefly this morning that there's some issues in the Japanese society today that we kind of see in American society today, but it's, it's different. Some of the same problems, but maybe a, 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 an, a, an extreme version of them, or ways that their society has issues and vices that ours does not. For instance, Japan's one of the safest places in the world, physically. Also would not be an example of that. But Japan, is also one of the highest places in the world for youth suicide. And there's reasons for that, and they're dark. 
you go and look at the education system in Japan and the pressure that's put on those kids from the earliest ages, you don't just do well on your test to make mama and daddy proud. You have to do well on your test to get into the best middle schools from which the best high schools recruit so you get into the best colleges to get the best jobs afterwards. So if you mess up in third grade, you have dishonored mom and dad forever and you can't fix it. What is a third grader going to do with that kind of guilt, that level of shame? They don't even know the gospel exists. There's another problem in their society. Um, I, you saw in the video some of the, the, the temples, the shrines, Budo Shintism, Shintoism. That has predominantly been Japan's major religious identification. But in modern days, in these mega cities like Tokyo, the main religion actually has evolved into more of just westernized secularism with a Japanese flair. Their society still worships pagan gods, but they just look different. In fact, they kind of look like some of the ones here. Material wealth, popularity, fame, position. One of the most massive, just earth-shattering problems in Japanese society has to do with this materialistic pursuit. Fathers have not been in the home for five or six generations because they work too much. The best of my research tells me the average Japanese work week is six days a week, not five like it is here. Be grateful. And the average work day is usually between 10 to 12 hours. Now, for some of you, you're like, oh, that's what I do already. And that's great. Work hard for the glory of the Lord. The difference is if you work a corporate job in Japan, you don't really get to do the clock in and clock out when you want. In fact, if you clock in earlier, you're actually seen as a more valuable employee and you're rewarded. And the later you stay, the same. And in fact, if your team has a great day at work and you made a good sale, you're expected to go out afterwards and party to celebrate the victory of the day, get drunk. And then you have to get on the train for your average hour, hour, 10 minute commute back home. You get one day off. What do you think Japanese followers do with their one day off? They don't go home, at least they try not to. And so the home is suffering. Moms are alcoholics all across Japan because of the pressures of living in that kind of society without a head to help. And we've already talked about the kids that are suffering in these homes and the pressures they live under. The city of Japan has an aging population that no one wants and no one's caring for. We think in places like Asia, the elderly are respected, and in general they are, but if your dad has dissed you your whole life, and he's now in his late 80s and 90s, you know, you're kind of an elder yourself. If you don't want to talk to him, you don't have to. There's, there's an entire generation of older Japanese people that have cut themselves off from their own family due to poor decisions and live alone and die alone. No one even knows they're dead until their apartment starts to smell. Also in Japan, there's a, a mass of people who instead of choosing the suicide route because of their dishonor and shame have just been outcast from society and they live amongst each other as the homeless groups. Who's reaching them? Those are the people that have bowed the knee to materialism and have been let down. They could be the most open to the gospel, but they don't know what it is. There's many more ailments in a city as massive as Tokyo some challenges that not just missionaries face when we go over there, but Christians who live there face day in and day out. And we believe the Lord's put a burden on our heart to go there. And the question that we ought to answer before we do so is this, how are we going to address all of these issues and problems in society? The answer you actually heard in the video we're going to plant a church. And here's why. Most of the, the issues I've just laid out are being addressed at a government level in cities like Tokyo. But they're not working, and it's not the government's job anyways. The problem that Japanese people have at the root of things is they're not born again. 
We'll talk about that when we get into the text this morning. They don't know the Great Commission we read together this morning. They don't know what Jesus has commanded them. So our strategy is fairly simple. Go to Japan, preach the gospel in all avenues God gives us opportunity to do so. Those who believe, we disciple them. Those who are qualified men in their discipleship, we push on them to aspire to the office of the pastorate. And with a church formed, we train and qualify and push and train all these things for that man to someday be the, the leader of that congregation. The reason that's our model is because that's what's in Scripture. Even in the most complicated societies on the planet today, the model still works, and the model is still the same. Plant churches. That'll be enough of that for now. Just a quick word about us. Lord willing, we're, we're looking to depart for Japan this summer. As your pastor said, we still have a little bit of fundraising to finish up, and then we've got some language learning to start uh, before we go. Um, but my, my privilege this morning is to obviously introduce myself and tell you about these things that you ought uh, prayerfully consider what it is to regularly commit to pray for us, even partner with us. That's your decision to make. Uh, but even greater than the opportunity that I've just had is the opportunity to open the word and to declare to you my heart for why we do missions to begin with. So if you have your copy of the scriptures, we're going to be in Psalm 67. Some of you are probably already there. Do you stand to read? All right, if you would, go ahead and stand with me. And we're going to read the entire psalm, just seven verses. Beginning in verse 1, it says, May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us. See that? That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Thank you. You may be seated. In short, before we pray, what we just read is what's considered in scriptures to be a harvest psalm. So this isn't necessarily one that they would sing in the tabernacle or the temple, but you could. This was more of what we would think of as a holiday song, and you'd sing it in community after the great harvest has come in. And what we're going to see in this harvest psalm is that whoever this psalmist is, they're observing, they're watching how God has just blessed his people, and his heart erupts in worship. But it's not just worship of gratitude for how God has blessed them. He turns in his worship to look at those who are without. And so that's why Psalm 67 is an excellent passage from the Old Testament to look at why we do something as crazy as cross-cultural missions. But let's pray and ask that God would open our eyes and give us understanding. Father, this poem, this song we're going to read is thousands of years old, and it was written to a people who understood the cultural context, who walked in much closer communion with you than it seems people do today. Your word is very precious to us, but we are unable to understand what it means for us without your help. So we ask that your spirit would open our eyes, illumine these truths to our hearts, God, for this congregation and for my family, my prayer is that we would not just be arbitrarily stirred to feel good, to be thankful on the inside, 
for what you have done for us, but that we would move, be moved, as the psalmist is, to express our gratitude in evangelistic and missional ways. So God, do not just give us the desire to do what is good, but help us to will and to do of your good pleasure this very morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalm we just read is going to answer for us the question, why do we do missions? Why is this the way that God has designed it to work in this age of the church? What are our motivations? If you were just at, if we just were talking in the lobby beforehand and I asked you this question, you may say something like, we do missions so that people don't go to hell. Okay. That is 100% correct. But is there a, is there a better, is there a, maybe a, a deeper answer to that question? Maybe that wasn't your response. Maybe your response was, Jesus commanded us. Our king has given us a commission, so we go. And he draws whom he will. That is also correct. And that is a great reason to do missions, because we have been commanded. Maybe your thought, if you're a young, aspiring theologian, was we do missions for the glory of God. Which is absolutely true. In fact, that's actually, that's probably the closer answer to what the psalmist is going to teach us in Psalm 67 this morning. But I think maybe the grand answer to that question, under which the others fall, is this. This is what we're going to see from the text this morning. We do things like missions. We, we preach the gospel for this reason, to spread the worship of God to the nations. To spread the worship of God to the nations. And what we're going to see as we move through this passage is a few requests the psalmist makes that, that hint this is what's driving him. It's not the harvest that just came in. It's the fact that he gets to worship God. That's what's driving this. The psalmist thinks it's really, really important that we understand where he's coming from. The first request the psalmist makes actually comes from the second verse. He says to God that your way may be known on earth. Then afterwards, he says, your saving power among all nations. Now, just to clarify, saving power, don't think gospel necessarily. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, God physically, multiple times, delivered his people from dangerous enemies. Think more along those lines when we're reading this verse. Uh, his saving power here is one of his ways. The request is, God, would your way be made known? Your ways be made known. The psalmist wants God to be known. Okay, I get that. What's the significance? I think if we're not careful, that's really not our higher priority. We tend to want to present God not for who he is, but for what he can do for people. There's a distinction. The psalmist is not so much interested in how God can be used, but in people knowing who God is. This tells us that God, who inspired this psalm, is more interested in us knowing him for who he is than what he merely has to offer. Can you imagine an artist that spends nine, ten months on a painting and forgets to put his signature at the bottom? How absurd would that be? God designed us to be knowers of him. He put that eternity, that hole in our hearts, in our innermost being, to look for the thing that is greater than whatever else this world can provide, and it's him. And the psalmist is concerned that his unsaved neighbors don't know that. That's where he starts. God, would they know you, your ways, who you are, how you work in this good world that you created for your glory? I think sometimes we, we, we sympathize rather pitifully that God's not getting the praise he deserves, like he's some local 
high school football coach who's putting in the extra hours to make his team great and no one gives him any attention. The psalmist is bothered here. His God, the one who made man for him, is not even known by the ones he created. We're going to say more about the second request, but I want us to notice what the psalmist does with this desire. Again, the desire being, oh God, I want them to know you. What does he do with this? That actually comes from verse 1. Read it again with me. He says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Selah. So what does the psalmist do with this burning desire for the pagans around him to know his God. He asks God for graciousness or mercy. Yeah, um, oh, sorry, the words were throwing me off there. You got the, the title in there. He asks God for mercy. He asks God for favor. And he asks God for material blessings. And before we just move on from that, I want us to deal with this verse because... We need to ask ourselves when we come through scriptures like this, is that what we're supposed to do? I get that we're, we're supposed to obviously ask God for mercy. That's, like, if you're a believer, you've already done this. You were confronted with the gospel which told you, on your own, you are condemned. You must have the mercy of God to spare you from your own sin, from the wrath that you deserve for the things you've done. So we get that. We understand God be merciful to us. Maybe even God have favor on us, make your face shine upon us. But he asks in this verse that God would give him material blessings. And I want to ask if we're able to do that. Are we allowed? This is the Tulsa area, the, the, the heart, the, the, the heartbeat, the, the center in many ways of this prosperity gospel charismatic movement where this kind of sounds like that. In the Old Testament, God displayed his power and love to his people by, like we just said, physically protecting them from enemies and prospering them with good health, lots of kids, lots of cattle, money, land. In the New Testament, that is not necessarily what is promised to us, is it? In the New Testament, God doesn't promise protection and wealth at all. If he did, if that's how it worked in the New Testament, who would be the one of all the New Testament characters, besides Jesus, I'll give you a hint, who would be the one to have the most healthy, happy, and prosperous ministry of them all? It'd be Paul, wouldn't it? Yet hear what Paul has to say. And I'll read this for you. You can turn if you want to 2 Corinthians 11. But he says, are they Hebrews? Well, so am I. Are they Israelites? Well, so am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? Oh, I am a better one. Can you imagine saying those words? I'm a better servant of Christ. He was. That's why he could say that. And how did God deal with his servant, who was greater than all the rest? With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I was adrift at sea. And he keeps going for verses afterwards. This is the tension. This is what I want us to deal with this morning, because when we come to the Psalms, they are here for our instruction, that through patient and hope we might endure. This is, this is for our sanctification here. Can we do what he did? Church, I have good news for you. I think we ought, full-heartedly, all capital letters, yes, pray Psalms 67, verse 1, to God exactly as written. God, prosper us. Have mercy on us. Make your face shine upon us and bless us. And it's for this reason. The psalmist is not asking for these things for his own benefit. He's asking for these things for the sake of someone else. That 
That sounds a lot like what James was talking about, isn't it? He says, you all ask, but you don't receive because you're asking for your own selfish reasons. That's not what's happening here. The psalmist sees that the nations don't know his God, and he asks God, would you bless me in such a way that they see it? That, that your way may be known. This isn't about me buying a private jet. This is about the nations knowing that the people you promise to protect and bless will be protected and blessed because you are God, and that's what you said you would do. I want them to know that. Church, we have a commission as well. No, we're not promised the same things in the new covenant that the psalmist was in his But when is the last time you prayed, God, would you give me a raise so that I can give to the Women's Crisis Seed Clinic here in town, clinic, uh, organization? God, would you bless me in such a way this year where I can contribute to missions? And maybe it's not even money. Maybe it's something like this. God, would you have mercy upon me? Give me favor. Give me a clean bill of health so that I can finally have that gospel conversation with my doctor who just despises you and thinks you're not real, you don't exist, you're powerless. Church, why are we not praying this way? Perhaps, perhaps we don't have the same missional interests that the psalmist does. And thank God for the psalm to help correct our thinking. Let me say this before we even move on. I hope you're praying for the nations. Obviously, we are to pray that God would bless us to be able to give to kingdom work. But what I don't want you to hear is exclusively missions. There was one pastor who said this well. Along the lines of, is everyone a missionary? That may have been the question that was asked. Not necessarily a missionary, but here's the reality. There are people in your life that I will never meet. And even if I did, I don't have the same influence with them that you do. But that's okay, because God put you there. I don't have to be there. There are people in your life who do not know Yahweh. Welcome to the Great Commission. It is for you. And I hope by the end of our time this morning, there's a fire lit within you to take those gospel steps and begin having those conversations. Coworkers, children, grandchildren, Neighbors, especially neighbors. But we must move on. The soul must understand God wants to be known for who he is, not just the things that he can do for you. So he asks, God, bless me that your way may be known. That's verses 1 and 2. But there's another request here, another hint at the psalmist's view of God that I think we miss. The second thing that is requested here or desired is that the nation's would enjoy God. The nations would enjoy God. That's not a normal thing to say. But look at verse 3. Let the peoples praise you, O God. What does that mean? If you were moved with the worship this morning, you know exactly what that means because it just happened to you 20 minutes ago. This is the real deal praise. This isn't the used vacuum salesman at your door just trying to get his commission. I don't think that happens anymore, does it? It Happened when I was a kid. This is where when you talk about God, the people in your life know that that's the real deal. He even says in verse verse 4, Let the nations be glad. Let them sing for joy. He is distraught that the nations aren't doing this. The nations must enjoy God. Remember, we said the missions exist to spread the worship of God to the nations. How can they worship God who they don't know? But also, there's an element of worship where there is an enjoyment, a reveling, a treasuring of who God is. I think the psalmist is on to something here. This thought wasn't original with me, but man, it was helpful. We don't realize this at times. But what we really value, what we really enjoy, 
comes out of us all the time, and people see it. In fact, you could, you could say it this way, what you enjoy shows what you value. There's a really important game happening tonight, I heard. And tomorrow at work, your coworkers are going to know which team was your favorite by your face. I know that's a silly illustration, but we know what's going on there. It's the same as when we get the granddaughter the thing she's been asking for all year for Christmas. She just lights up. What does she do the first day of school when Christmas break is over? Takes that thing to school and shows everybody and tells them how wonderful, not you are, unfortunately, but how wonderful her gift is. The psalmist has something very special. He gets to know and worship Yahweh. And he looks around at the pagan nations surrounding Israel. And he realizes, yes, God's not getting the glory he deserves, but they're missing it. They don't have what I have. Imagine, who are these neighbors of the psalmist? It's the, it's the Hittites, it's the Midianites, all the other Canaanites, Philistines of old. They don't truly worship God because they don't even know him. They don't enjoy him. They rather are enjoying so-called the false gods of the pagan lands and the, the false promises made by those idols and religions. They think they're having a good time, but not only are they deceived, should you hear this part? They're missing out on the joy that comes from being in relationship with God. That's what's wrong. We see this today. Maybe we don't have Baal that we directly worship, though child sacrifice seems to be just as alive and well as ever. But there are lies in our society that we buy into. And some of them are more silly, some of them are more serious. I wrote down a few. The bigger TV will make me happy. Or the newest phone, whatever. We know that it won't. We know, because when the next one comes out, we go through the cycle all over again, right? What's happening there? We're asking something that isn't God to give us the kind of joy that only God can give, and it lets us down every time. How about this? Boys being attracted to me will make me happy. Or girls. Giving in to sexual ideologies that divert from Scripture and what God's good world ought to be. That will make me happy. And, and if I can find a community of people who are just like me, I'll be satisfied. Many are going down that route, and they are not finding the happiness they were promised. Making lots of money fast will make me happy. That's an easy one. We all know better. Yet we're still tempted, right? The mysteriousness of the war within our members. Getting out of this marriage will make me happy. Fixing my relationship with my children will make me happy. Having the right president in office will make me happy. If you notice through this list, some of these things are bad, but some of them aren't. There's a mix. And that's important because here's the point. They're all lies. The, the kind of happiness the psalmist is experiencing here as he sees the harvest coming in, it's so much more than the joy he's experiencing in the harvest. Do you see? He's experiencing a true joy, this will not make sense to some of you, that only comes from worshiping God and obeying him. And the reason I can say that so confidently is because that is why God made us. Everything else must necessarily fall short. And if you've lived any time in this world, you know it falls far short. We do missions to spread the worship of God to the nations. We, we, we instruct them who God is 
and we call them to worship him and to enjoy him, not the idols and the lies that they offer. Well, who is this God? It's very interesting. If you notice when we read through Psalm 67, verse 3 and 5 are identical. You don't see that super often in the Psalms. But what this means is that what's in the middle, think of like a sandwich, if you will, is really important. And what you find in the middle doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the psalm. My best guess is that what's driving the heart of this psalm are just two examples of who God is to his people. There's much more that could be said, but for brevity, we're only given two snapshots of who this God is. Read them with me in verse 4. He says, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for, here's the reason, here's who you are, for you judge the peoples with equity. We'll talk about that in just a second. And guide the nations upon earth. Now, it, if you had to write Psalm 67, and you had to slip in a couple of lines about who God is, my guess is that's not what you would have picked. But I think given his context, these two make a great deal of sense, and you might find that actually they really hit home today. What does he say first? He says, first, you judge the people with equity. These these pagan lands are being judged by very wicked and corrupt people. People who take advantage of the innocent and the poor. People who do the most evil and vile things that it's a shame to even speak of in public. That's something to get happy about. No, 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 but watch. There is an actual judge, though, who's not like them. There's a judge who judges the people with equity, with righteousness. He will not be corrupted. Christians, we we worship a God who has seen every wrong thing that's ever happened to you. And he will hold evildoers to account. That's kind of exciting. When we fast forward to the book of Revelation, we see John as, the, as, he, as he beholds the lamb that was slain, but yet stands, and, and the lamb takes the scroll. We celebrate as the scroll is open, God's judgments are revealed, but we often skip a little part of that story that happens right before John looks up, and it's this. He weeps because no man was worthy to open the scroll. You ever thought about that? The scroll is God's judgment on evil. And when the when when the command or when the the call was given through heaven, earth, under the earth, who was worthy to open the scroll? No one could be found, which meant judgment would not happen. All the people that John had watched be persecuted, martyred even, for his dear Savior, justice wouldn't be done. No one was worthy. But then the lamb went up, took that scroll, opened its seals. Christians, a day is coming where Yahweh, who's taking notes, will judge every wicked deed. Non-Christians, let me clarify who I mean by that. Either you've been in church your whole life like me, But you're playing the game, and you somehow think that you really can do enough good to get God off your back. This word is for you. Or maybe you've got this whole Bible Christianity thing figured out. You know better. It's a bunch of silly myths, you know, written by men, therefore. The Bible's not true. Talking to you. Or... Maybe you're just a young person in here, and all this stuff is really crazy and complicated, and you haven't figured it out yet, but you want to know more. You're asking questions to mom and dad. Keep asking those questions. But if you're a non-Christian in this room, you don't rejoice because of verse 4, where you judge the peoples with equity. You fear that, and you ought, because a day is coming, as we'll see later even in this text, where you will be held accountable for all that you have done in defiance of your good and gracious king. And yet, ironically, he says, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. 
What's the second part of this sandwich, if you will? He says, you judge the people with equity, and you guide the nations on the earth. Essentially, God is taking notes, so Christians rejoice, unbelievers fear. But now he's just said, they're pointed out, these wicked kings ruling in injustice and debauchery, they think that they are the ultimate rulers or guiders of the affairs of their nations. They think that. The leadership of our land thinks that. But they're wrong. They're dead wrong. God is the one who guides the nations of the earth. Japan has their emperor, but Japan also has a king, and his name is Jesus. And he is the one who guides that nation. America has a president. America also has a king, has the same name, who, mind you, is taking notes. What great joy and peace comes from knowing these simple two snapshots about our God. And there are a million more. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for that is who God is. The psalmist is burdened that God is not getting the glory he deserves from these people. Why do we do missions? Because it's not good enough that just we got to sing those beautiful songs this morning. It's not good enough that it's just us. We've got to bring others into this. The nations, your unsaved co-workers, they do not know God. They don't know he rules over them and he judges righteously. They don't know that. And therefore, they do not delight in him. And therefore, God does not get the glory he deserves. So we do missions to spread the worship of God to the nations. You see the heart of this psalmist. May this be our heart. Let me encourage you, Christians, do you pray for missions this way? God, would you do whatever you need to do in me and in my home to prosper kingdom work? Let the people praise you. Let my unsaved boss be glad and sing for joy. Because right now he's not doing that. He is bought into the lies of corporate world. But you can change his heart. Open his eyes where he can become a worshiper, not a fearer of the one who is going to take notes and judge righteously. Church, do we pray this way? I'd also commend you. Do you pray this way for yourself? Do you worship God like this? And don't hear me saying, I'm the guy who's always here. That's not what I'm saying. But I want to be like this psalmist. I do, all the time. How much more potent of a gospel witness would I be in this sense? Psalmist wants the pagans around him to know his God, and he wants them to enjoy his God. And there's a third request that comes in verse 7, but we need to deal with verse 6 first. Look at it with me. There's a very peculiar phrase. It says, the earth has yielded its increase. Again, it's one of those things where it's like, what, what's happening here? Because I thought we were on track. I was following you, and you got to pull out one of these. I think what the psalmist is doing here is he's looking out over the harvest fields. You know, he's looking at the wine presses, the clusters of grapes that have been brought in, all the new cattle running around. And he is he's teaching in Psalm, saying, people who know and who worship Yahweh benefit in this life. Their land does better. And here's why, by the way, there's not this mystical connection. It's because they till their soil to the, in the fear of God. 
They don't cut corners. They're honest. They, they walk in integrity. This is part of the Great Commission we forget. Jesus said, go and teach them everything I've commanded you. Where the gospel has gone in history, pagans become civilized. Lands of poverty have become wealthy. The arts and scientists, before they got really weird in the last 150 years, came from Christians who looked at this universe God created not as pagans, but as, as those who know that God is orderly and he designs things a certain way. Let's explore that. Let's test that. Where the gospel goes, civilizations prosper. Well, that's what's happening in verse 6. So we even pray that for missionaries. Like Japan looks like it's prospering. You saw the video, there's lots of shiny lights and big tall buildings and maybe a happy smile every now and then. And if you go to Japan, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's one of the most wonderful places on earth. But from the inside out, it's been corroding away for five or six generations and will probably collapse within my lifetime. Because there's not God-fearing there. There's a lot of man-fearing there. And as long as that continues, their civilization's hollowing out from the inside. Our civilization's hollowing out from the inside. We all know what I'm talking about here. As the gospel leaves a civilization, the earth doesn't yield or increase like she used to. Gas prices aren't as low as they used to. I know it's not that simple, but you know what I'm saying. That's what's happening here. He's looking at the blessings of God and longing that the nations could have them. The last request we're going to see in the psalm comes from verse 7. It says, God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Or maybe your translation says something like, the ends of the earth shall fear him. We want the nations to know God. We want them to enjoy God. And for their own prosperity in this world, they want them to be fearers of God. But there's some things we need to take away from that phrase. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. And the fact is this. All the ends of the earth one day will fear him. They don't right now. But they will. Again, God created this world to do that. He, he's going he's gonna to make sure that happens. One pastor said it this way, missions is coming to an end because God is going to finish his mission. We don't do this in heaven. Yes, we worship, but we don't spread the worship of God to the nations because it's there. Here's what this means for us, church. We do not have unlimited time to do this. There is an urgency to get the gospel out. But I thought God's going to save whoever he will. There's a day coming where it's going to be too late for your neighbor. And your neighbor will fear God. Right now he doesn't, but he will. And it will be too late. Oh, to have a world full of God-fearers now. Oh, to have churches filled with God-fearers now. Let's bring this home. What does this mean for us, church? This idea of spreading the worship of God to the nations. For you, I'll say this because this was me in a pew a lot like yours when I was a youngster. Maybe there is a tug to want to go to the places like Japan where they haven't really rejected the gospel yet because it's not taken root there before. Maybe that's you. For, for now, my encouragement, by the way, is make sure you're being a disciple maker here where you're at. But there is a sense in which God calls people to these international cross-cultural works my encouragement to you, if you're that young person, give your life to that. Do it. 
what more valuable thing could you do with the one life God has given you? A few thoughts for us Christians. Pray for the joy of the nations. I know that's a weird thing to say, but that is what the psalmist is doing, and he's doing that because he sees how God has been good to himself. So maybe there's the progression there. Heart check. How has God been good to you, but you're missing it? May we be about the business of rekindling our own joy in who God is. That way we may be effective spreaders. And in that, by the way, that starts with knowing God, like we said at the beginning. Maybe if you've lost that fire, that passion, and I'm not talking about like you had it yesterday, today it's gone. I'm talking, it's been a long time since you've had a Psalm 67 experience. Maybe you need to learn more about who God is. Maybe it's time you pick that mysterious book of the Bible and study it and let your mind be rekindled on the truths of our God. We've already talked about how we should pray for God to bless us that we may contribute to kingdom work. So I'll belabor that again. Let me give one more commendation to those in this room who are not believers. I want you to praise him and sing for joy. We think of missions as something with future benefit. People don't go to hell, which again is true. But you can commune with God now. Turn from the idols and the lies. God has never cast out a single person that came to him. Not a single one. Fling yourself upon his mercy and find out what it is to experience this kind of joy. Why do we do missions, church? It's to spread the worship of God to the nations. May we be about the business ourselves of knowing, enjoying, and fearing him. Let's pray. Father, thank you again that you have given us your word. Thank you that you have given us your son. And through his death and resurrection, we've been given, born again, unto new life. Or stuff like what we just read in your word makes sense, and it lights a fire in our hearts. Thank you that you have taken each of these, your dear children in this room, and you have been merciful to them, and blessed them, and caused your face to shine upon them. My only request is that you would be further kind to myself, this congregation, that they would be marked as people who know, enjoy, fear their God, and delight to bring others into that worship experience. Do this to your people, your kindness, through the blood of your Son, we ask this.